Mind's Eye, Astro the Horror Girl, here at you again with another episode of Press Start to Scream. I am joined by one of the greatest ever horror gamers, renowned through the centuries past, Big Scared. Hello, and thank you for joining me. Centuries of gaming. Thank you for mentioning my non-euclidean form of course uh, so so thusly and so so early in our our meeting here today well i i've always been one to just never beat around the bush uh, people deserve <laughs> to know your magnificence what can i say behold my eldritch glory exactly the centuries passed like people were were talking in the time of uh a lot, not a lot of people know this, but some people couldn't make it to the Gettysburg Address because they were watching <laughs> the speed runs that you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, back in, back in my day, in my time, when I was just a Ute, even, uh, they were drawing my avatar on these lovely murals inside caves. Perhaps you've heard of them. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> An effort has been made to preserve them. Only, only, only a slight effort. Though. Yeah, it's it's okay. Not enough. You can hardly recognize that it's you. My legend persists regardless. Indeed. And now I'm here. And I am so happy that you are here. <laughs> so, I will start where I pretty much always start with my guests. What is your favorite horror game, or what are your favorite horror games? So I don't think I have a singular horror game, but there are five that I come back to on a very regular basis that I have no problem saying that these are like some of my favorite games, right? Uh, The obvious one that I talk about probably the most is Alien Isolation. I adore that game. I play it several times a year, at least once a year on Nightmare Difficulty. So I, I have much experience with it and it never gets old to me um even though it is a daunting experience uh prey 2017 is another one that i just chef kiss it's on my top five shelf i'm broadly going to lump resident evil into one amorphous blob because if you ask me to pick one i can't but i love the franchise and so they're they're in there somewhere um, if you hard press me, I would probably say either three or seven as like my favorites of the batch. With Survivor just barely out of the top two, I understand. Yeah, I <laughs> I can't deny the fact that me, Vincent, my mother is in the game, and she makes a point <laughs> of telling me that. Um, Survivor's whew, it is one of the games ever. It is. It is. So is like Dead Aim, right? Like that, <laughs> ooh, one of the games ever. Uh, enjoyable, but is it good? Hmm. Perhaps there's time to unpack that later. Other like horror experiences that I really, really vibe on, like Silent Hill, of course. Two is my favorite by far, but I also really like Four and Downpour for meme reasons, largely, because I'm that type of person. I'm a gremlin. Listen, um, my second favorite Silent Hill game is Homecoming, so you're in good <laughs> company here. <laughs> I never finished that one because I soft-locked it so hard that it made me so mad that I haven't gone back. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. People are often surprised to learn that I am a FNAF head. So, there's that. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. I know. But maybe, I'm like, maybe you I just know me good enough. Yeah. But like, many people will, they'll come to my to my side of the internet. They'll enter my presence and be like, "Wow, Resident Evil's so good." And then I'm just like, <laughs> "Freddy Fazbear," and they're like, "What?" You know what I think it is, is that there's this, there, there's different crowds of horror gamer. It used to be, do you like Resident Evil or do you like Silent Hill? Yeah, it was the choose your fighter choice. Yeah, and and then with the advent of many more indie titles, 
such as Five Nights at Freddy's, there became this sort of difference between the people who are like, yeah, I love Resident Evil and I love Silent Hill and I love Clock Tower. Like naming the classics, the the mm-hmm. big title classics that inspired everyone and kind of avoiding the internet sensations. Yeah. And I think over time it's become even more like tiered. There's like the triple A horror folks, right? They're like, we love Resident Evil. We love Silent Hill. We will play the evil within. It's a good game. Uh, and then there's like the, the indie horror folks. They're like, yes, I love Signalis. Yes, I love Heaven Dust. Yes, I love uh, the insert whichever itchio sensation is on the top of the chart this week because those sort of come and go and are fleeting but they're very fun experiences or like yes i'm really into uh what emica games is doing right right and then there's like on a different tier altogether i'm not gonna say it's higher or lower but it is it seems to be a separate crowd is the like mascot horror folks yeah um and that crowd tends to lean a little bit younger too I was actually uh, talking with my partner last night about mascot horror, and mm-hmm. she literally said to me, "What is mascot horror?" and and she is someone who's you know has in the past really really loved Silent Hill, still loves uh, Clock Tower, mm-hmm. and also loves uh, the old '90s horror point and click games. And so mascot horror just as a genre mm-hmm. has kind of like been underlooked by a large amount of people who play horror games. I think that it's yeah. a niche that emerged out of almost almost like the next step of what creepypastas became, as it were. Yes. And I think that's why I gravitate towards it, right? Because it's... It takes something that's very familiar and something that should not be threatening and it flips it in a way that is often, not always, um, innovative and it it catches you by surprise and not in a literal jump scare way, but like the presentation of the experience is novel and it's interesting and it's not something that these AAA studios are often trying to provide. I I think that, you know, AAA studios are going to do what they're gonna do which is exactly go on the tried and true method of knowing what is definitely scary and providing something for that so Mm -hmm. i think uh the evil within as much as i i love the evil within and the evil within 2 is one of my favorite horror games of all time compared to Five Nights at Freddy's, it's a very safe game. Yeah. For sales and such. And I remind people, there's no way that the Dead Space remake would have happened if Capcom hadn't had success with their Resident Evil remakes. No way. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. because it's like, you really think EA cares about innovating horror? Like, absolutely not. They don't care. Like, I also think it's pretty telling that some of the larger, like, AAA horror releases have been remakes of well-established, beloved franchises, right? We've got Dead Space, we've got Resident Evil, we've got Silent Hill coming down the line. Even Metal Gear's getting a remake. I think you're onto something in that there is a level of safety that these studios are seeking in doing this. But I think there's also, like, a what do people love and I want... I want to make sure that people love the experience that is playing out this way, right? It's not necessarily like, oh, I'm going to gamble on the safe thing. It's like, oh, what do people, what do the children yearn for? The minds. Okay, what has minds? Resident <laughs> Evil, Silent <laughs> you know? Right, right. Well, because I think that the only, and I think that some people would debate whether they're a big publisher or not that is putting out original horror is Devolver. Mm-hmm. Devolver's huge. So Devolver putting out all these unique entries into horror, and while they don't sell 
like uh, the big blockbuster hits. They do sell. Mm -hmm. They do get uh, followings. They do get a lot of people interested in them. Something to note about them is that the difference between them and someone like a Capcom or EA, for example, is that they're not going out of their way to make sure that the game looks photorealistic or that Mm. the game is going to conform to the very popular sort of action gameplay that people are used to from adapted titles such as um, Uncharted, Horizon, or even something like like a Call of Duty kind of thing. They are not concerned with that. When they're going to put out a game, Devolver largely is just like, oh, it's a it's a horror game, a very original one, a very interesting original one. Yeah, let's go for it. Let's put it out there. Let's see what happens. That's how you breed creativity in a genre space is you just go, yeah, I'll throw it out there and see what happens. Otherwise, it brings us to a bit of a stagnation in the space. Yeah, Resident Evil will always sell. Yeah, I bet you that the Silent Hill games are going to sell. Sure. But it's not going to lead to anything profound within the genre if there's no exploration done alongside the established titles. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting that you highlight Devolver in particular because they're they have a wide selection of horror stuff, right? But they're not exclusively a horror publisher. And I think that gives them a little bit more freedom to be playful with the genre, right? They are able to include art styles which deviate from what we would expect, like hyper-realistic, hyper-mature, hyper-graphic. We have much more varied in, not only in terms of like is this a is this a fps game versus a, a static third no they, they have like roguelike horror games <laughs> they've got like just a wide variety of stuff but then when you start thinking about publishers that are exclusively horror focused like i'm thinking about puppet combo mm. and i'm also thinking about um chila's art and i'm also thinking about like the haunted PS1. Like this tier of very niche for the community by horror for horror people. And even in these spaces, the creativity that's flowing is out like astronomically overwhelming to me. Like every time I go to the puppet combo page and they have a new game, I'm like, okay, it it cannot be more unhinged than it was last time. Uh, last time was Killer Easter Bunny uh, murdering teenagers in a house. Okay, what is it going to be this time? Power Drill Massacre. Okay, you. Okay, I see where you're going, right? So I think we're in a really interesting time for horror games because there is so much out there. And most people think of these AAA studios because they get the most attention. But if you're willing to dig just a little bit deeper... There's probably something that's literally made for you. I would agree. And I think that horror has always been this way. Mm-hmm. This is this is something that's very comfortable for horror fans to be in. It's just like, you mean to tell me that there's horror that's actually really good if I just dared to look deep? And it's like, yeah, it's always been yeah. that way. It's It's been that way since... Uh, even in film back to the like 1940s it's been that way Mm -hmm. so horror fans are very used to having to do a little bit of extra searching for their horror titles that they want to get into which brings me to a question for you Mm. what's a horror game that you wish more people knew about oh so I know you know about this game because we've talked about it several times, but there is a horror game that I speedrun called The Chant. Mm. Uh, It's by Brass Token. It's their very first game, and it is incredibly robust. 
uh, it's a psychological horror that is also a psychedelic horror. It draws on eldritch themes. Uh, it references the work of Lovecraft without being racist or shitty. We love uh, that. And it, it plays with a lot of ideas that are in our modern zeitgeist. Like, TLDR, the premise is... Uh, you're you're going to a spiritual retreat to heal, but plot twist, it's a it's a cult, uh, and and there's there's stuff there that isn't of this world, even though it is very much of this world. And now you've got to confront what that means, and also try to help these people that don't really want your help. Um, it's a really cool experience. It is beautiful. It is vivid. It is. So horror, in particular survival horror, I complain about a lot because it is desaturated. It is hard to see what you're doing. The chant is the opposite of that. It is vibrant. Everything is very visible. It is an extremely playable game, and it is unique. I'm not going to spoil the combat for you, but it has a very unique combat system. Yeah, I got a very Annihilation vibe from it yes every time i've i've seen something of it yes it's very much in that like the intersection of like annihilation and the fog no no mm. not the fog the mist the mist the the one that's sad <laughs> <laughs> yeah right because it's asking questions that are more about like yes there are these horrors that we don't quite understand but the story is about the people there which is why I compare it th to that in particular. But yeah, it is. I also get a lot of like Stranger Things vibes from it. So it's a good time. I am. I'm going to play that one day. <laughs> you should play I, it. One I day. really want to. Uh, I, I don't know. I just, just haven't gotten around to it. I really want to. And I see you speed running it and I go, I want to play that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good time. On a casual run, it, it, it'll take you, like, less than 10 hours to finish. The usual um, horror game length, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't overstay its welcome. And I think that's something that I really like about the horror genre, is that, like, yes, there are horror experiences that are in the 30-ish hour range, but the vast majority of them are things that you can very easily get through in one sitting. Or reasonably get through with like one or two sittings, um, and so it's a it's a concise story that's easy to follow, and you don't gotta spend months to get there. And I think that horror has always thrived in its short form. Mm -hmm. Short stories are where some of the best horror has ever come from, and the most memorable horror put to film has been movies and not shows for the most part. Mm. And it's sort of like when you think of horror film that has changed the genre for better or for worse, you can think of maybe one show that did that for every 10 movies that did. That largely has to do with just horror as a short form storytelling kind of way it's it's very effective yeah and i'm thinking like even more modern like short form media i'm talking like made for youtube made for tiktok made for these bite-sized consumable moments that is some of the most compelling like cutting edge horror experiences i've seen and there is one example i'd like to point to like lights out it's a feature length film, right? It's a it's an okay movie. It's not bad. I definitely put it on the B shelf. Like it's not it's not on my favorites. You but are it, kinder to that movie than I am, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Like it's like on the, the low B high C shelf for me. Like I will watch it, but I probably won't pay full attention to it. But the short that that movie was created on, mm -hmm. riveting, engaging, seat like edge of my seat the entire five minutes. And so I think there's something to say about, like, the ability to curate your horror experience in a way that doesn't allow the viewer to become inured to it. Like, you don't want 
I'm gonna talk again about Alien Isolation. Go it ahead. is one of my favorite games, but people often criticize it for being too long. And I agree, it, it could probably be like four hours shorter than it actually is. And it would retain the essence of the story and it would feel less unpleasant because the last final chapters are really, really repetitive. You're walking back and forth between certain objectives. The alien is on you the entire time. And it's it reaches a threshold where it's no longer stressful. It's just obnoxious. And so I think short form, like really like hyper short form is effective because it doesn't give you enough time to grow used to what they're doing. It's just unsettling enough to keep you invested and then it's over and you're like, wait, what was that? And now it's living in your mind rent free for the next week because what was that? I... Versus, oh no, I'm being jump scared by the same thing 15 yeah. times. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean because I've said the same thing about Alien Isolation. I've said that masterpiece of a game that's a bit too long. Mm -hmm. Especially with how many fake endings it has <laughs> it like, has like three fake endings yeah. and any of them would be perfectly fine ending points that make sense but no it it has a, a random cliffhanger ending and then it has a sequel astrid mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a mobile game <laughs> that's in the style of five nights at freddy's but with alien <laughs> Yes, I've played it. Of course I do you not, have. I, I do not think it is um, worth the dollar they're asking for it. The moment you said it's in the style of Five Nights and Freddy's, I was just like, oh, Big's already played it. <laughs> I have played it. Of course it's, you have. It's fine. It's fine. It's like a dollar on the app store, but... But yeah, it's not worth know? the dollar. No, no, it's it's too. My complaint about Alien Isolation applies to Alien Blackout. It's an interesting idea. It's a it's a novel formula. I like the experience. Too fucking long. <laughs> it's too, it's a mobile game. Why is it a ten hour mobile game? No way. With strategy, and if your characters die, you don't get like you don't get. Rep so, like, the five people that you got to keep alive, you got to keep them alive the whole ten hours while you're doing the Five Nights at Freddy's thing in the vents with the alien. It is one of the most stressful things I've ever played, and I have zero intentions of replaying it. <laughs> cool game, though, for a dollar. But, like, ugh. <laughs> Before you came on to this podcast, which I'm very grateful that you agreed to be on here because you're wonderful as wow. we said your your tales through the centuries uh, precede you yeah my myth and legend mm -hmm. you were finishing up a speed run of resident evil 3 remake which one i want to point out you got a pb i did it was small but it's mighty indeed and Second, I wanted to ask you, horror game speedrunning, uh, what got you here? So, a couple things got me here. Um, I was not a speedrunner when I started streaming in 2021. Uh, I, I simply was like, I like scary games, I'ma play them. And I started with Alien Isolation, and I never looked back. Um, but then... I met Beep Salt is what happened. <laughs> you know? Uh, they found me one day. They raided in, and we didn't know each other. I was playing Resident Evil 1, uh, and I just got to know them over time. And then I joined their stream team, the Clock Tower, and in, in there was a bunch of speed. Like, I landed in there, and I saw Schmumbler in, in the Discord, and I was like, mm. oh, no, mm. there are real speedrunners here. I'm in the wrong place. Uh, and then I think it took me about a month to be like, how do I go fast? And it really just sort of spiraled from there. Uh, it was very positive encouragement, very gentle, like, hey, if you just focus on doing it for you, try not to get competitive with it until you're ready to just have fun with it, pick games you like. And it sort of went from there. The first game I spent, uh, did speedruns for was Half Dead 2 which is an indie game. I it's, know that game. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You did for a speedrun of that? 
Yeah, I hold second place on the five by five map and Incredible. have for like two years. Incredible. Um, I have been working towards a all maps run. Like I want to do the the five, the, the four, five, six, seven, and eight back to back successfully. But that is so much RNG that I've only made it to the six. All right. See, we don't need to play Fortnite together. <laughs> we could just play Half Dead together. It'll be fine. I mean, we can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I started with that because there were only four runners and it felt like an approachable community. It didn't feel daunting. And it's a game that is 99% RNG. So if the run fell apart, I didn't feel like it was something I would take personally. Um, and so that was like, that was my dip my toes in the water speed run. And then I got second place out of four runners. And I was like, oh, okay, that wasn't so bad. Where do Heck I go yeah. from here? And then I jumped immediately into one of the most competitive runs, Resident Evil 2 Remake. <laughs> and yeah. I, I'm, I'm not competitive in that game at all. But I got my goal of less than an hour for the campaign, which is not on page one of the leaderboard. But it's no longer page three of the leaderboard. Uh, and I'll take that. <laughs> it's kind of where I land. And so as I move forward, I'm like, okay, what do I have interest in? Uh, what do I have access to? And what seems like it would not be unpleasant to learn? And that's sort of how I roll from there. I find it interesting that our speedrunning journey is kind of... They started the same way, and yet they did. they went in different directions. <laughs> um, and yet we're still we're we're both horror speedrunners. Yeah, um, we run very different games. Yeah, uh, my journey also started with Beep Salt. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have to get them a plaque that's yeah that's got a tile on it for every person that they accidentally got into speedrunning. Well, it was it was one of those instances of just like Beep Salt showed up in my stream talking about horror games and so I was like well this person has a check mark next to their name so they must be a streamer themselves saw that they were in fact streaming they were playing a horror game that I really wanted to get into and then we kind of uh, just talked from there and I noticed that every single person in their twitch chat was like a speed running name that I knew because I, I've been watching GDQ and stuff for years. Mm. Always wanted to do speed running, but I have had uh, basically just imposter syndrome, self hatred, and all these other things that would stop me from getting into it. Like, oh no, you. You see the stuff that these speedrunners are doing? It's crazy. You could never be that good. And there was one game that I knew if I was ever going to get into speedrunning, it was going to be with fear. Mm. At that point in my life, I'd already beaten it like 70 times or whatever. I was like, I know the game. I'll try to do it fast. And so without looking at any strats, Without looking, without looking up any of what the runs were or anything that was in for fear already, I just went, how fast could I do this? I recorded my time and I did it in just under two hours. Let's go. So I was like, okay, let's look at the leaderboard. And that was just in front of like last place and I was like okay let's look at the strats then <laughs> they got gotcha. you yeah so then after like three attempts I had gone up like six places in the leaderboard I started watching uh people's runs trying to figure out what they did started optimizing it got my time down to where it is currently which is 12th place before I realized that it was like, okay, speedrunning? This is fun. I don't think I want to do it with fear, though. And so after fear, I started looking at 
games that I knew that I liked that I had fun with but didn't have a very large community so I wouldn't feel Mm -hmm. intimidated jumping into it which by the way I want to say that like going into fear I just was streaming it put a clock on and fear speedrunners like found me immediately (laughs) yeah there's something about fear so I have entertained the idea of picking up the glitches line for fear Fina bless her heart has sat in a call with me for way too long trying to teach me things. Mm -hmm. But the reality is I've only played the game a handful of times, and I just need more hours in the game to understand how the AI will react to me under certain circumstances. Here's the thing, though. You won't. You won't ever. Because the AI is... It'll feel less painful, you know? The AI is renowned for being, (laughs) like, these monsters that just, like, some of the best coded AI in gaming... Like That's true, it's... but I'm I'm not talking about like their advanced patterns. I'm talking about something as simple as remembering to move forward and backwards when I'm shotgunning the big guy, so that way he only does melee attacks, gotcha. like that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. those are the base level processes I need to get into my muscle memory for that game. Um, but I also have to like shout out to clowns here. Clowns has been a very vocal and prominent member of my community. He was one of the first people that ever followed me. Oh. And and he's been a very vocal advocate of me learning speedruns because he's believed in me since day one. And so, like, outside of the community that I found through Beep Salt, I have to credit the fear folks because they're some of the first people I found on Twitch and they've been some of the most supportive advocates towards me doing this. That makes me so happy. Because, yeah. like... Clowns was one of my first five followers. Yeah, I used to bother clowns all the time. Because uh, when I got into speedrunning, I joined the community and I was like, hey, I'm going to start doing some some, some speedruns. And clowns responded to that saying, I never check SRC, so just message me when you yeah. have <laughs> And I was like, okay. So I would just do, like, these, like, like little tugs on clown's shirt just excuse me mr clowns bestie I... clowner please <laughs> i i have another one <laughs> and of course he's like yes i'm on it yeah yeah i had to do that to specter gamer when i finally uh when i got that world record for extraction point hey. and uh specter gamer was like oh I actually have to moderate something. (laughs) Um, The the fear community is always looking for people to speedrun, which is why I think that they're so feverishly like big scared fear. You're gonna you're gonna (laughs) gonna run. You're gonna run. Which is wild to me because that game is not a new game, and it has such a passionate following of folks that like they've been running this game for a long time, and they still run this game. Mm -hmm. Like. It's, they, they don't, like, maybe they'll get mad at it for a while, but they will come back to it. That is not the case I found with Resident Evil. Two Remake being the exception here. That one is still very commonly ran. But we've talked about this many times. Uh, I, I currently hold one of the gold records for Resident Evil Village. It's a category extension. It's the third-person mode glitchless run. Um, I am one of two people that play third-person mode. Mm-hmm. And I'm the only active runner for the entire game, category extensions, and main game right now. I'm the only person that's actively still submitting runs. That's wild to me. Yeah. There are eight people that are active runners for the game total. Um, Even the mods have more or less stopped paying attention. So it's, it's not necessarily... I'm not saying this to be salty or anything... But there is a pattern with some communities where they just, they get a new thing and they move on. That's not the case with fear. This is why, um, for myself, 2023, Trepang 2 is game of the year. (laughs) And yet, so many people who play fear are, like, terrified of the Trepang rung. They're like, I don't want to do it. These bosses, I don't want to do it. 
even though it's is... a very similar experience. Yeah, like casually it is, but the runs are wild. Um, <laughs> there's uh, 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 several different speedrunning categories for it. And they basically break down into restricted and unrestricted versions of both. Mm -hmm. Restricted is simply no out of bounds. Unrestricted is, yeah, go for it. And unrestricted is so intimidating because of how the out of bounds like works and functions. And Mm -hmm. it's crazy. Uh, You have to understand movement in that game so much better than you would have to understand in just a casual playthrough of the game. And then for the restricted run, it is a matter of kind of like the opposite end of that spectrum. Yes, understanding the movement and how your character interacts with the environment is extremely important. That is true. But it also comes down to, all right, but how fast can you just snap headshots? Because yeah. that's, that's the other part of it. So, like, the thing with fear is that in most instances, you are navigating through this map and largely avoiding the enemies. Trepang has the classic thing of when the enemies are dead, the door will open and you can go on, which leads players to have to find out what's the most proficient way to kill everyone in this room. And it's it's therefore different as far as the speedrun goes, but I digress. Trepang is my game of the year this year because I've always been a fan of Fear. Fear has been my favorite game for as long as it has existed, and I have played it. And... Trepang is probably going to end up being, like, uh, my second or third favorite game of all time after I think about it a little bit more just because it is the vibe that I want from my video games. It is lots of shooting, lots, lots of movement, and there's also a great deal of horror in it, too. I love that. There's also a mountain of claymores on the ground that you've put there to kick slide into, which I commend you for. Listen, I don't want to fight that boss. (laughs) (laughs) That boss is annoying. I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. I have not played Trepang, but I have respect for it because there's a Mothman in it. And Mothman, as you know, is my boyfriend. He's real. Mm-hmm. And we hold hands. If Mothman wasn't real, why is there a statue of him? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right, I want to hit you up with another horror take. Okay, okay. I want to I wanna dig deeper into, you mentioned, of course, you wrapped up all of Resident Evil just as a block favorite game. I get that because I largely do the same thing when I mention uh, Fatal Frame. Oh, those are so good, but they're so hard. Yeah, they are. They're so hard. I've never beaten one. I've tried. But listen, I understand. <laughs> um, I want to hit you up with the idea of... I think that people will do that with Fatal Frame. People will do that with Resident Evil. Mm-hmm. I don't often hear people do that with Silent Hill. So they do it in smaller batches Mm -hmm. with Silent Hill. There's people who are the Team Silent, Silent Hill. Yes. and I like Team Silent, Silent Hill. Or I like the American Silent Hills. Or I like the games with Cheryl in them. Mm, Yeah. I've seen people that are like, yeah, one in three in Origin. And I'm like, Origin? I've never heard that take, but I love it. Just because it's a different one. Just the Heather games. So Uh it's like... One, three, Origins chat memes. <laughs> chat memes, okay. <laughs> right? Because she's, she's in it. Y- you're not wrong. I just have not heard it called that, and I love that. Listen, it's chat memes. <laughs> you cannot convince me otherwise. I, I won't know attempt it has a to. Thing, but every time, I'm like, yeah, that, 
that is that is the experience of playing Silent Hill Shattered Memories, especially if you're doing it on the Wii. That is a chat meme. <laughs> I wanted to explore um, specifically uh, the two that you said that you like that are um, pretty, I would, I don't want to say controversial, but at the very least, there's a divide between Silent Hill fans on, which is four mm. and downpour. I would yeah. love to... I'd love to hear what about those do you really, really love? So I recognize that four is a very frustrating experience, right? And I also recognize that the water prison is mean. But I think the thing about four that I find really compelling is the fact that they are innovating on all of the things that people find inconvenient about horror games. It is a game-long buddy escort mission with multiple characters. Uh, it is a more or less silent everyman protagonist that's so bland and generic that it begs you to find anything about him that makes him a human being, right? It's playing with these really uncomfortable ideas of, like, voyeurism, which up until that point was not really a prominent thing. Um, it, it tackles, like, hostile environment. It, and the whole second act is, like, a love letter to backtracking. And, like, how do you do backtracking in a way that is fresh and different and it while it does task you to go through these areas a second time it forces you to rethink the area in a way that like i only see this happening in like sonic games right like how many ways can you beat this level there's this way to beat it and there's this way to beat it silent hill just forces you to do this in a linear way rather than a non-linear way um, and so I think that's what I really like about 4. Um, I also really think it's cool because it centers more non-Western horror stereotypes. Like, it's bringing in these Japanese ghosts. It's bringing in um, different types of creatures, different types of hauntings. And so while it is familiar to the Silent Hill experience, it also feels different to me. I don't know. I just think it's really unique and it's playful in its approach. Um, but I understand that that can be repetitive and frustrating for some people. Downpour, on the other hand, I like it because it's funny. <laughs> um, I think this game is not good. Okay, I want to <laughs> emphasize, I like this game. That does not mean it's good. That just means I like it. Um, downpour is a nightmare for in every sense of the word. The plat there's platforming, uh, it's it's horror. Ugh, I hate the platforming. Uh, the enemies, ugh, uh, the dialogue, ugh. But like when you throw all of these things that are garishly over the top in their unpleasantness in a blender, it just becomes comedic to me. When Murphy and the nun are yelling at each other over the body of his quote-unquote son that is very visibly a man larger than him and not a young child. <laughs> and there's only subtitles for one of them. I just lost it. Because it wasn't even the one you were supposed to be listening to. <laughs> right? Like, those are the reasons why Downpour is so enjoyable to me. Um, it is a game that defies you to play it. It challenges you to to finish it uh, in in a very profound way because it is so it's so bad <laughs> and like the payoff for it like you have to read a whole comic to even understand half the story. I could talk about downpour all day. That's what this podcast is for. To be honest, <laughs> I just love talking about horror with amazing people and. I am very adamant that, like, even though the player character is Murphy Pendleton, right? He's not the main character. Anne is. Anne Cunningham is the main character of that game, and she should be the focus of it. But we don't get anything from her except from, like, little blips and moments. You need to get on the bus. Get on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then she's just like, turn around. And you're like, where did you come from? And then she's falling off a cliff, and I'm like, ma'am. But then when you read the comic, it adds so much depth because you get to see not only how she perceives Silent Hill, which personally I found much more interesting, like Anne's version of Silent Hill, yes, it's foggy, yes, it's dark, but there's also like zombies crawling out of the ground. Mm -hmm. It's horrifying. Like parts of it are flaming. It's like she can see everyone's version of the town and she's grappling with the loss of her father, but he's not dead. So like she is a parallel to both Sybil and James for me. And the fact that they don't explore that in the game itself is something that I will always rant about every single time I'm given the opportunity, which by the way, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I honestly wish that more people from like past episodes of this podcast would just be like, Astrid, I need a place to just yell about a horror game. I love I'm like, I'll schedule you in. I played something. I need to yell about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, I played Tormented Souls recently, and I would like to yell about it. Please. Okay, so first off, play Tormented Souls if you haven't, dear listener. Um, it is a game. <laughs> you that know exists. who you are. <laughs> you know who you are, dear listener. Uh, it is a game that exists. It is reasonably priced. It will reference all of the things you love, and it will also make you pull your hair out at the difficulty of these puzzles. Tormented Souls is a love letter to like 90s third person survival horror and it does it in a way that is simultaneously one of the cringiest things i've ever seen but also one of the most beautiful things i've ever seen like the way they tread that line is artful i'd like to point out that tormented souls is as a survival horror game mechanically pretty excellent yeah as a game that is attempting to tell you the, tell you a story, I you can do a lot better. <laughs> yeah, the, the story <laughs> of the first game, um, if you are the type of person that likes content warnings and is sensitive to certain topics, please, for your own sanity, go look up the list before you play it. If you have hard skin and you are good with very sensitive topics handled in ways that are heavy-handed and perhaps not fully thought out, um, this is a game for you, right? Like, I see what they're trying to do, but I think there are things about the game that they just sort of put in because they're like, you know what would make it scarier? If she were fully naked. Yeah. They're like, no. Just, what? There's, And this is an issue with horror storytelling in general sometimes. Um mm -hmm. So, earlier you brought up Metal Gear. My favorite Metal Gear Solid <laughs> game is uh, 2, Sons of Liberty. And I knew the second you brought that up after saying naked, it yep, was going to be 2. Yep, exactly. So, you have Raiden running around naked. That was such an effective use of making the player feel vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And... It's an inversion of the way that Metal Gear has always felt. You're not supposed to feel vulnerable. This is Metal Gear. What are you talking about? It's it's also uh, showing Raiden at his worst, basically. So you're forced to be in this situation of the worst place you could possibly be if you are Raiden. And I feel like a whole bunch of horror people looked at that and go, Yeah! If we want to do that, all we have to do is make people feel naked and just just put naked people in the game. Just do it. It'll work. Without fully understanding the context for why nakedness can be used in an effective horror medium to convey something mm -hmm. chilling instead of feeling on one end of the spectrum exploitative while on the other end of the spectrum lazy. Yeah. And I think there's an extra layer that, like, is often forgotten when you apply that. So the reason why nudity works for write-in is not the same reason why nudity works in a game with, like, a femme-presenting protagonist. Right. Um, there are 
additional layers of trauma and violence that are often associated with that type of body that I don't think dev teams that are led by men understand fully. Like they grasp it conceptually, but I don't think there's additional thought put into the way that that could come off because of the way that the stereotypes are often paired together, right? And so for me, the nudity and tormented souls read as a much more severe thing than it was probably invent intended to be simply because of the way the bodies are used and the heavy handedness of the team that you body, right? Right. It's really interesting that this is where the conversation went also, because that is not the first thing that came to my mind when I thought of what I disliked about the writing of Tormented Souls. Um, you see, every time I replay, Tor that's the thing that sticks in my craw. Uh -huh. There's full frontal nudity for no fucking reason. Right. It does not have any, there's no reason. It's just there. And then at the end of the game, they make you revisit it and they remind you, oh yeah, there. remember when there was the full frontal nudity at the first five minutes of the game? Mm -hmm. It makes me so mad. It didn't, they, they could have told that story without that and it would have been a, ugh. I, I'm 100% on your side. I agree with this. Cause and that's like not even touching the way that they're presenting the monstrous femme body, right? Like the monstrous feminine in Tormented Souls is so repugnant and so viscerally upsetting that I didn't even realize she was naked until the end of the game. Mm -hmm. Which I guess is the point, right? But ugh, all the same. <laughs> right. It's... uh unfortunately like all too common in horror storytelling in obviously not just games but horror storytelling in general there are people who are extremely influenced by okay okay i'll go here go off go off right. girl i'm i'm here for it i've got my popcorn i'm munching i hope everyone listening is munching with me <laughs> so one of i think the most applauded most celebrated horror movies of all time is the silence of the lambs mm. and i also think that it's really good but mm -hmm. i can say that with the acknowledgement that hey, this film was also really harmful to uh, trans women. Mm -hmm. It wasn't intending to be that way, but it did come across that way for a lot of bigoted people, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that, and that's frustrating, and I wish that it wasn't that way. I wish that it wasn't something that kind of had to be talked about, but I feel like it does. Because a game that... I really, really wanted a love that I had to stop because of how pissed off it made me was Tormented Fathers. Oh, don't don't get me started on the remothered games. Oh, listen, I said I was going to go here. <laughs> listen, Tormented Fathers hurt, but broken porcelain. I was so mad. Ugh. Continue. I want you to I want I want to hear where you're going with this before I jump in. I think that it is another example of people who were very influenced by, and I, I think Tormented Fathers is extremely influenced by Silence of the Lambs, mm -hmm. but they focused on all the wrong shit to be influenced by. They saw a, a man dressed as a woman and were like, that's disgusting. That is scary. I want to make my game featuring something like that. And that concept comes from, like, not only Silence of the Lambs, but also, like, Psycho and everything. Mm -hmm. And I want to point out, this isn't an impossible thing to talk about. Like, I'm a trans woman. I understand better than a lot of people do the stigma that is directed toward me. But also, as a horror fan... I recognize that you can do this storytelling in a smart way. Simply put, Tormented Fathers does not. It's mm -hmm. very, it's, it's either, it is literally either intentionally trying to be transphobic 
or it is handled so poorly that it comes across that way. And no, I think it. I think at that point, when you have a media that's so well established, like Science of the Land, if that is the thing you're choosing to highlight, mm -hmm. it's intentional. That's my suspicion. Like, and maybe they're not. Like. Here's where the intentions versus impact conversation becomes important, right? Like, did they mean that as a, here's why this is bad, right? Or did they mean it like, ah, here's this bad, scary thing, be afraid of it. Um, and a lot of times people will create something with the intentions of being like, see how bad this thing is? And then it comes off like, ah, this thing is bad. I don't necessarily think that's the case with this game. No, right? neither do I. I think that might be more true of a game like Deadly Premonition, right? Where there is yeah. transphobia, but I feel like it's it wasn't the intended purpose to make a transphobic game. It just kind of happened along the way and they rolled with it. Not that that's a good thing, but I think those distinctions are important to make too. Because that's the type of dev team that can like learn from it and grow. Playing through Tormented Fathers, I'm like, I don't know if I want to play the second one. And then the second one came, and I'm like, you did that to trans people, and now you're doing this to lesbians? I would, I would love to see horror gamers distance Clock Tower from Remothered with, yes. a, with a harsh, bold line. Because yes. it's, it's frustrating to me how many people are just like, oh... If you like, if you want a more modern clock tower, play Remothered, and it's like, please don't. Like, well, so if we're gonna have this conversation, we need to talk about Clock Tower Three. This is fine. Um, which is unfortunate because out of all of the Clock Tower games, it's the one that I enjoy the most. But the central theme is a a threat of incest. Indeed, and it, it's so, shit like that that like, carried over too to um um yeah what's it called if, uh, if, haunting if grounds. It carries over into haunting ground. It carries over into night cry. It informs remothered, and so I think the presence of it isn't inherently bad, right? Because the ending of Clock Tower Three, good triumphs over evil. The pervert is banished to the shadow realm. All yeah. is good. Uh, the evil is undone, and and the Deus Ex Machina of the game resolves itself. But in the games that take inspiration from that type of theming, the way they try to subvert it is by letting evil win, or by finding an unpleasant solution, or by leaving the narrative unresolved in a way that just leaves you feeling gross. Yeah, it's as for all the um, sort of frustrations that I have with uh, Clock Tower 3. I think it at least is a situation that is um, a lot of people would find tough to write about. And they mm -hmm. do it in, I think, a way that handles the situation well. And I would even say that Haunting Grounds does, too, to a degree. And that's a lot harder to talk about what's going on in Haunting Grounds. Yeah. But, like... I think that everything bad that's going to say, be said about Nightcry has already been said by everyone. <laughs> I don't think we can um, say anything new that is negative about Nightcry. Yeah. Um, so skipping over the train wreck that that is, um, going into Remothered, it's, to me, it changed the narrative of, let's talk about um, psychosexual horror. Mm-hmm. And actually point a finger at a marginalized community and go after them. Which is never what Clock Tower 3 wanted to be. No. And it's not what Haunting Grounds wanted to be either. Haunting Grounds, at the very least, like, it wanted to be something that was just like an entire sinking feeling of traumatizing horrific atmosphere that you cannot get away from remothered says but you know who's really at fault it's the lgbt community yeah and i think i got i will give them a poopy colored star 
for at least saying it with their whole chest, right? <laughs> you yeah. you look at that game and and you leave it and you're like, okay, there. Anything you say that says this was not intentional is probably going to be a bare ass lie or a PS PR stunt. But if you look at other games that have similarly detrimental execution of their theming, like another studio that comes up a lot is Bloober for the way they handle things like mental health. Oh, yeah. Uh, violence, particularly of sexual nature towards women, mm -hmm. those sort of things. But the difference here that I want to make, and I want to give Bloober their cookie, right, is that it's very clear that their intention is not to single out these communities as the perpetrator of these things. They're including these communities, like, uh, I want to point to the medium in particular. It's a story about, like, assault and childhood abuse and the ways that that can shape people to either uh, embrace the negative things that have come about them or to fold under them, right? Better or worse. And the ending of that game is controversial. It's not positive, and I don't think it's done well, but I do think that throughout the game, they make a point of being like, okay, yes, this person is mentally ill and unwell, but their actions are still their actions. And they make that distinguishing point of being like, mentally ill people are not inherently violent. This is just the circumstances, right? And I think there's a responsibility that they understand with handling these topics, that at least they're trying to not cause harm along the way in telling their story. I cannot say the same of the remothered folks, right? Yeah, I, I do not wish to give Bluebird their cookie. However, I didn't say it was a good cookie or a listen, fresh one. Listen, <laughs> it, for, for me, simply, it's like um, Bloober overestimates their talent of writing such a sensitive story. Yeah, they often miss the mark. I, I think that, like, I, I agree because Bloober, I don't think, yeah, I don't think Bloober is trying to do harm. Yeah. And I just think that they're bad. And it's like, listen. <laughs> Y'all should just shut up. Just tell <laughs> tell me a story about the haunted house. Don't tell me about the layers of psychological trauma because you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, like, and I, I also have questions about like how much of it is lost in translation, right? I that's feel true like too, yeah. some of their stories would be really artful if they weren't trying to snatch a global market. Right. If you just told me the niche story about this Polish internment camp and all the shit that came out of it, and you even did it in Polish, right? Um, some of these things that come off as thematically awkward might hit differently. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, basically to sum up, uh, Bloober is either a victim of terrible translation, mm -hmm. or they're simply not talented enough storytellers to tell the story that they want to tell. That's that's how I see it with Bloober's case, which is why I mean, I'm extremely nervous about Silent Hill 2. <laughs> yeah, that's where I was going. I'm like, speaking of beloved franchises getting a remake and also studios with a history of handling things a little... Mm, yeah. Um, that's one that I've got a very, like... I've got a keen eye on what's going on with that one. And every time I see stuff about it, I'm like, oh no... James has visible feelings here. Yeah, and that's the thing. If, if James, if James comes out of this story, after everything that Bloober has done, if James is the character they say is the redeemable one, I'm gonna be like, oh my god, there's there's no way. <laughs> after yeah. after everything that you said about who are irredeemable characters, Bloober, you're, if you're gonna say James is the one, that's fine. That'll be an interesting choice. <laughs> I mean, it is one of the endings, and it is probably the easiest one to get on your first playthrough. But every time someone says that James deserves to leave Silent Hill, I'm like, oh, you didn't... Did, you didn't replay that, did you? You Did you read the lore? Did you get the other endings? Because for me, James belongs in the lake. That's, where, that's his home. That's mm. where he lives at the end of it. You know? That's... <laughs> It's it's what he deserves. 
it's and that's the thing is like Silent Hill 2 is good enough that that is a conversation that can be had about what does James deserve for what he's done? Hmm. That's the whole question of the game, actually. Yeah. yeah. And to be perfectly honest, I don't trust Bluebird to ask me that same question. No, they they will verbally ask. They won't imply the question ever. Um, it'll be painfully obvious from the beginning that James is the bad man that has done the bad thing to his nice wife. Um, yeah. And we're going to have to listen to him talk way too fucking much about his feelings, which is not inherently bad. I wish there were more representation of men processing th feelings, particularly mm -hmm. in video games. I just don't think James is the one to humanize in 2023. Right. I think there, and this might be my Silent Hill hot take. There is a time and a place for Silent Hill 2, and that was 2001. Okay. Um, I don't think that a story where your protagonist is potentially redeemable after they've committed violence against their spouse, their partner, regardless of the context, like we're. We're post-pandemic right now, right? right? James euthanizing his wife hits different now. Yeah. Um, and so it's a relevant conversation. I just don't know if this is the one to have, right? Um, I think there are many ways to have this conversation, but I, I you know, I, again, the responsibility, the impact of the story, people are dying. Mm-hmm. I think that it you know? <laughs> is, well, I, I think that there is a way to do Silent Hill 2 today. Mm. 100%. Put him in the lake? Well, that's one one way. <laughs> um, I just simply... How do we get abducted by alien? Or, you know, realize that it was a dog the whole time. <laughs> yeah. But to me, it's simply... Um, I just keep coming back to there are development teams that I would trust to do this story and ones that I would not. Bloober is not the ones that I would. I really hope, and this is, I always want to make clear to people. I really hope that Bloober proves me wrong. I really hope yeah. that Silent Hill 2 comes out as its remake and it's the greatest remake of all time because I love Silent I don't Silent know if Hill I want 2. it to be the greatest. I don't know if I want to give that to Bloober. I want it to be a successful remake <laughs> that I have limited questions about, right? Like, right? I want it to be unremarkable. I want it to be good. I don't want it to be the best. Just out of spite for the other things they've done to us. Listen, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me rethink my answer, too. It's like, yeah, maybe I don't want Bluebird to have that. I do want them to surprise me, and I want it to be good. Mm -hmm. I do expect it to be base level good. But I, you know, I want to feel the way that I feel about, like, Resident Evil 2 Remake. Where there's some things that are different, and some things that are the same, and it's just kind of a different game, and it's fun to play. I don't think about it too hard. That's the experience that I want from Silent Hill Remake. I feel like if they try to give me anything else, I'll be frustrated with it. I like that. I also like you, Big Scared, because you're amazing. Wow. Wow. So here's a question. Okay. And this, I think, will be a fun topic to riff off of. If we don't necessarily trust some dev teams with a story like this, who would we actually trust? Who would I actually trust to do Silent Hill 2? I wish I had a list of development teams in front of me. <laughs> Part of me's like, I would love to see what pop Puppet Combo could do with this. Demake it. Make it even shittier looking. Yes, make it, <laughs> Make it even raunchier. I want Maria to call James a simp or a cuck. I want her... <laughs> yes, yes. I want Pyramid Head to graphically slice someone in half. Yeah, yeah. And I want it to be in the lowest poly 16-bit... Uh, head barely attached to the body sprites. I need that in my life, okay? I want it to be so over the top in its execution that it is, like, 
an 80s slasher. That'd be fun. I do not disagree. <laughs> it's sort of like um, the movie, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, which is, if any, anybody hasn't seen it, it is a parody sequel to the first one by the same director and the same team. <laughs> I love Incredible. the fact that that was what they went for with their sequel instead of just doing the usual sequel thing. Um, they went, no, how do we make this more ridiculous? How do we throw it even further over the top? Yeah, they have a chainsaw duel in that movie. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Texas Chainsaw is like the one franchise that I have the least sort of overall understanding of i've seen the first one and i've seen the remake but i haven't watched a lot of this listen you have seen all the good ones okay that there we go yeah. uh two is hilarious and three <laughs> is the first movie that heath ledger was ever in so there's historical context there oh baby Heath. yeah um Let's... i i want to before before i go i want to come up with an answer to your question though who would I trust with that narrative? Who's a Who's that team that did uh like the bad dream games? Oh. I'm like I'm in my steam right now. If Desert Fox was like doing Silent Hill 2, I'd be like, "Yeah, I'm on board. Cool. I'm here for it." That's valid. And the other uh, developer I would trust for it would be um, the team that did uh, uh, Cat Lady and those games. Oh, Blumhouse Lane folks. Yeah. <laughs> those games are, they're buck wild. They are. And I say that affectionately. Mm -hmm. Buck wild and also deeply traumatizing. Yes, 100%. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Lorelai. I'm looking mm -hmm, at you. Mm -hmm. Good games. I yeah, I agree with you. They would get it. The combat, the combat though, in that style would be interesting. That's, we we can give the um the movement graphical stuff to to like Bloober. That's fine. Just as long as the storytelling isn't given to them. <laughs> Listen. I think the one thing we can agree on here is as long as the Silent Hill remake does not end up in the hands of Ubisoft, we'll oh. be fine. You don't want Silent Hill to you zoom out on the map and there's little markers on it. And, and the <laughs> HUD with 80 bajillion indicators yeah. that take up 90% of the screen. And uh -huh. then the active quest that pops up a paragraph over what you're doing. Yeah. I love that level of accessibility. I just love when it's optional and customizable <laughs> you know what i want is to um just be moving around silent hill and then just on the screen comes up a window that i have to click out of that says <laughs> uh quest log updated yes and the quest log is simply going to be something like... Um, Take 500 steps inside uh, the hospital. I was going to say, like, what's the most Ubisoft named character I could think of? Like, um, <laughs> uh, like Matthew Steele wants to meet you. <laughs> Matt Steele has an update. Check your yeah. email. <laughs> Check your PDA. <laughs> check your fitbit yeah because <laughs> it's gonna be you know it's gonna be like a now that we're having unhinged what if ubisoft made <laughs> <laughs> in my head it's just all like assassin's creed the like infrared mm -hmm. i can see them and like james is crawling through the hospital <laughs> get a pop-up it's mary did you yeah. get my letter mm-hmm and then the window comes up after. After that is done, another window comes up. No, James goes, huh, what could she mean by that letter? <laughs> yes, yes. And then you get another one that's an email from Eddie saying, I'm at the bowling alley. Come get pizza. <laughs> As you're on your way to the bowling alley, he's just like, doesn't he know this town is full of monsters? How yes. can he be there and eat pizza? 
<laughs> yes, he sends a voice memo back. That's a text message. It says, how can you sit there and eat pizza? Yes. <laughs> it's not even a cutscene anymore. It's just a text conversation that you get via pop-ups over the actual gameplay. Mm -hmm. In a non-sequitur, like this happens while James is on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Also, the boat is like um, some sort of special spy boat, too. The it's... boat is also a metaphor. Oh, of course. <laughs> For the actions of his past. Mm hmm. Which the game will, as an Ubisoft game, we'll get to the other side. A thing will pop up and say, You feel refreshed after rowing the boat like you did when you were younger. <laughs> You have to climb while you're on the rooftop of the hospital before Pyramid Head knocks you off. You have to climb on top of the fence to get a map locator. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, you miss it and it doesn't update your map. Yeah, yeah. It's not a pickup anymore. It's You just got to go to this viewpoint to get the right view of everything. Once you 100% your map locations, though, um, it plays a nice little jingle, which is yes. pretty sweet. <laughs> yes, you get the nice bork, 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 bork moment. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Oh, perfect. Mm -hmm. That's the perfect place to put it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Big scared. Good time. You are wonderful. So are you, Astrid. Thank you so much for joining me on my podcast. I think I will end it there. And I do invite you, if you play a game and you're just like, Astra, I need to yell about this game. You just let me know. I'll, I'll set up something and we can just continue. <laughs> Listen, one of these days, I will hate myself enough to finish Selma and then I'll be back. You got it. I love talking about Selma. <laughs> All right. Once again, everyone, this has been Big Scared. You can check out Big Scared on Twitch. Is there anywhere else that we can catch you or anything else you want to say? An announcement? Anything? Uh, yeah, I am on Twitch as Big Scared and most places of the internet as either Big Scared or I'm Big Scared with no punctuation or spaces. Um, if you don't see an anime VTuber, uh, it's probably not me, so <laughs> take that with a grain of salt. Uh, I can be found also in other places. I do a lot of hosting and commentary for the Arcaders, and I'm also putting together a little speedrun marathon with the stream team this upcoming October, so stay tuned for Cock Tower Time Tick. Yes, that's the name of it. Rumor has it Astrid might be in that. Uh, Allegedly. 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 The schedule has not dropped, so stay tuned <laughs> to figure out whether that, that, that scandalous rumor is true. Indeed. Thank you again for being here, Big Scared. Once again, everyone, I am Astrid the Horror Girl. This has been Press Start to Scream. I'll see you whenever I do another one of these. Goodbye.